So hello everyone and thanks for joining me in this uh, talk that we are going to be doing, that I'm going to be doing about performing sentiment analysis on video with uh, serverless architectures on Amazon Web Services. My name is Eduard Espes Borras and yes, I couldn't find a longer title for my presentation. But but I think that it really summarizes everything that we're going to be talking and a concrete example that I want you to present and that I want you to explain. OK, a little bit about myself. Uh, as I said, I'm Eduardo Espes Borras. I'm a, I define myself as an agile software architect. Um, I have more than 15 years of experience. I've lived in Belgium for over six years or so a little bit more. I've been a Scrum Master, Technical Lead. Um, I've co-founded uh, an Internet of Things Partners and also I'm the founder of 4K Software. That it's a consultancy company where I give advice about... Uh, uh, I do trainings, I do advice about uh, scalability and about new technology to big companies and to startup companies around the world. I mean, I've worked with companies in Singapore, in New Zealand, Argentina, of, of course in Belgium, Germany and also over here in, in Spain lately. Uh, I'm also a professor at, uh, the, uh, at the UAB, the Autonomous University of Barcelona, and also I'm at La Salle University. Um, and also I'm lately I've been working on a project that is Oikovideo, and, and Shapik, and both of them are around the, the video and how to treat video. One is in real time, that is Shapik.com, and the other one is uh, Oiko Video, that is how to send messages uh, with video. And with all of this, uh, let me really. If there are three things that I want you to get out from this talk, I mean, whenever we finish this talk, if there are three things that I want you to know, the first is is Amazon Web Services is awesome. If you didn't know it, <laughs> is you never realize it. Amazon Web Services is awesome. So it really makes sense to spend some time um, really getting more proficiency with it. So getting to know all the services that they offer, um, how, which are the best practices, and how to architect uh, an application on it uh, because it really it really pays off okay the second thing is uh, that i want you to to get out from from this talk is about vendor in architectures i mean it's something it's not new it's been already for a while but for most of us um, going from a traditional architecture to a more vendor in architecture it means uh, shifting, doing a mind shift, no, um, and that's but, but that's also something that it pays off. So, really, uh, another thing is to take off from this talk is also check out event driven architectures, how to make an architecture more reactive and, and based on events so that everything kind of triggers an events and. And, and everything, I mean, you can create pipelines, complex pipelines, and I'm going to show you one example, but uh, really investigate more about that. And the third thing, and it's about um, Amazon Chalice, that it's a framework in Python, and it's for creating serverless applications on, on Amazon, okay? And we are going to get more into detail about these three main components and main, main objectives but before starting just keep in mind this <laughs> is that's the only four minutes that you're gonna watch this video or this presentation uh, just check this out a little bit more okay so first of all let's talk about the motivation so the motivation it's uh, this project that it's oiko.video that uh, I was just starting uh, so let me show you what we are talking about. And uh, it started kind of for giving a video surprise to my uh, wife. And the idea was, okay, whenever you load the page, you see, uh, you see myself that I'm 
that I'm explaining that I want to record some that I want that everyone sends me some videos, no, to to congratulate my my wife, no, on her birthday. So whenever you press uh, the record button, then it starts recording, no, like uh, we are doing just now, no. So it starts recording. You press stop. Okay, and you send the video. So it started like this, and right now um, it 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 already grow, no. So it's not only for sending videos back and forth, asking for um, for uh, for videos to congratulate for birthday, but it's also a little bit more than that. And we created kind of a pipeline of how to interact in a more closely way uh, even when we are away no i mean right now with the covid that everyone is uh, at home and we are a little bit more detached no from each other but we still want to to get closer so what do we do we send audio videos in whatsapp and nowadays even we are sending more video selfies and because we want to get more into it no and that's something that is changing the communication so that's why we thought that this is a, a good project and and we start working on it okay so what did we want to do so it's not just uploading a video what we want to do is whenever someone sends you a feedback video about uh, because you are asking feedback about your project about your coaching session that you did we want to extract um, data because data is everywhere no but in the video, that is mm, the main form that people is communicating nowadays, uh, there's a lot of information. So we want to extract it and one of the ways is really transcribing it and and getting the text out of it, no? And all of it, I mean, it helps out to, to index it because then we can index the video and we can know in which section do we have which part. But also at the end, what we want to do is we want to say um, the sentiment analysis. No, we want to tell to the person that is requiring, so requesting for uh, feedback. No, is sending a requesting video. Um, if okay, the, this feedback it was good or bad. No, and we can already start filtering the videos. No, to know um, in which. So discovering the the people opinion, emotions, and feeling. No, about the product service. So that's what we want to achieve no we want that the people can interact with videos um, in a more close communication through this service okay and for that we need to really analyze the the video no so I mean just a little bit joke no that the data it's everywhere no? as mm, Gilbert was saying no um, so let's pray no because the data is everywhere it it's on the cloud no and it's gonna save us all no but uh, as I used to say, you know, whenever I teach about big data, for example, that nowadays it's not, uh, it's not the big topic, no. But the data is as important as the percentage of information that we can extract from it, no. So that's why uh, analyzing video in real time or or on a batch processing and extracting the data, um, I think that is one of the the key topics that is going to be for the next times no so how do how do we do it um so if i ask this question i mean maybe a few years ago most of people will have said that okay we have to create a project no the typical monolith project where multiple people is gonna work on it and we're gonna create different models one of these is gonna be the machine learning pro part and we are gonna yeah single database no so all the things not that I used to talk in the art of scalability uh, sessions no I mean that deals to kind of these problems no a lot of different models that has to interact with it and and that's the difficulty no of working on this kind of monolith process whenever they grow up no so but how do we do it today no how will we do it nowadays no so the idea will be to go for shopping okay and, and go for shopping since it's Black Friday. The idea will be uh, going for shopping is gonna be going to Amazon Web Services. That's why I told you that it's awesome. And I start checking from the hundreds, I mean, 
I don't know, hundreds, but yeah, more than 100, I think 136 services, more or less, that they have, no? Uh, and I start checking which are the main services that we could use for our purpose, no? And one of the services that we could check is Amazon Transcribe, for example. They just automatically convert the speech to text, no? So from an audio, how do we convert um, this audio to text? Um, but first we need to have the audio, so we need to um, to extract the audio out of the, the video. So that's why one of the projects that we will select would be Amazon Elastic Transcoder that will give us the, the potential to to really convert this video that people is uploading into multiple formats, no? I mean, mm, because people is uploading videos with uh, just a phone, but this phone um, can send, I mean, it, I mean, it has a high, high, high resolution, and most of the time we don't need this high resolution, no? So it's a good thing that whenever someone uploads some video or images that we convert it to an standard, to an standard case, no? So Elastic Transcoder is a service that we could use and that we are going to be using in, in our project, okay? And another one and final is the Amazon Comprehend that is inside the machine learning services that Amazon already offers. And it's a service, so you can use it. It has an API. And what it offers, the Amazon Comprehend, is that uh, whenever we provide some text, uh, it analyzes the the key the key topics, the key phrases, the language, um, which are the main entities, and also the sentiment. So if this text is really uh, about something good or bad, no. Um, so that's a little bit the idea that we had, no. And all of this is gonna be. I mean, we are gonna be using, of course, the typical big services like Amazon DynamoDB, and to glue up everything, no. A, a service like a simple notification service that is a pop sub subscribing messaging system, where you publish a message, and this is gonna be, yeah, a pop subscribing message, no. And so at the end, we are going to have a, an architecture kind of like this, no? that we people upload videos to S3, no? to the storage system in Amazon. And from that, we're going to start transcoding and then operating and analyzing all of it. OK. So just to show you some serverless architectures, because uh, I've been working on during the last uh, four or five years in serverless. So and and for example, that's one of the first one that I've been working on was for one of the companies. Uh, that's a simplification, no? But um, that's already using lambdas, no? To catch up, I mean, uh, a REST API and to catch all the posts and to requ uh, the requirements and how to parse the data and process it and store it in, in the database, no? Uh, but we can do things like, for example, one of the person that I've been working lately it was it was a blockchain uh, application, so we were using Hyperledger Fabric, and again we were gluing everything using Lambda. So um, for doing the I mean with GraphQL we were doing queries and mutations, no, and and whenever we were doing queries and we were uploading images uh, actually for doing the queries we were using services like Amazon Recognition or SageMaker, no. So we can use uh, actually that's the the gluing from everything is the the lambda, no? And this is the project that we are talking. I mean, how do we analyze video, and we do all these operations, no? So the thing will be um, the user is requesting to upload a video. From that, we do a call to our serverless application, and um, we ask for a presigned URL, no? That is, okay, uh, Amazon give me some permissions so that I can upload a video directly to S3. Although I don't have access to S3, no? Because, I mean, we don't want to provide access to everyone and even less to upload videos, no? This is not a public Dropbox. So um, what we do is the, the presigned pre URL. That is this, this first operation, no? This first exchange, no? Where we request action to upload a video and then once we upload the video to S3 there's an event that is dispatched saying that okay a video has been created and then we use the Amazon transcribe 
to do the, all the transcodification to generate all the transcoding in the different formats and all these different formats, the audio, the different video formats, and even to create some thumbnail images, not in the typical some thumbnail image that we want to show, uh, we can all do it in one operation and uh, using this service, no? Amazon Elastic Transcoder. This is stored in another bucket in S3. And then from that, um, we use Amazon Transcribe, no? from the audio that, that we generated, we use Amazon Transcribe. And we have kind of two S SNS, no? One, if if there's an error, we want to send a mail to to notify the, the user that there's something has gone wrong, so there's been an issue. And if something goes correctly, then okay, because this is an asynchronous operation, uh, whenever this is done, it's gonna be a notification in another SNS that is gonna be the transcribe complete. And then this is gonna be triggering the Amazon Comprehend that is going to be doing the analyzing, no? And once this is done, finishing analyzing, it's going to trigger, it's going to dispatch it to SNS, and this is going to be stored to DynamoDB and Elasticsearch. It looks simple, okay, but um, actually we are going to have a lot of lambdas because the lambdas are, I mean, we we said that the SNS, no, the simple notification service is the glue, but actually the glue here are the Amazon Lambdas. So Amazon Lambdas are these functions that are executed um, and that has a short leaf. No? Actually, you pay per milliseconds and per CPU and memory that you use. So you don't expect to do a batch processing for half an hour, but you expect to do multiple small operations. And in this case, we're going to glue everything together. So when we say uh, we upload a video to S3, this is dispatches an event. Amazon Lambda captures, captures this event and triggers the other uh, uh, service that it is transcribed. No? So you see that Lambda is in the middle, actually coordinating all the operations. No, I mean, whenever the SNS dispatches an event, we have two Lambdas, one for storing to Elasticsearch, another for storing to the DynamoDB. So we have, um, even in this small simplified version, um, we already have already six, seven, uh, eight lambdas that we have to to work with, no? So that's why some people say that, okay, a typical architecture in serverless is something like this. So it's about, it's a mess. So there's a tons of different services, a tons of lambdas that you have to coordinate. And there's also patterns that you have to, so there's uh, serverless patterns that you have to know. And that's why there's some frameworks, like for example, the serverless frameworks is one of the most popular. They say that it's zero friction serverless development. Actually, that's not true. <laughs> I mean, the main friction here, it's not the serverless project, it's, it's the serverless uh, project itself. So this serverless.com, you need to learn all the syntax, all the configuration. Um, if you want to work with Amazon, you need to know all the syntax. So actually there's a lot of um, things that you have to really get proficiency, you know, before doing anything. Um, but here we are, we love Python. So I suggest you check uh, Chalice. So in Chalice, uh, it's a framework for writing serverless application in Amazon Web Services. And if you check this syntax, for example, this is a real example. It looks like a Flask application. So just using small annotations, you can automatically uh, create, um, whenever you deploy it, you're going to be deploying, creating a Amazon Gateway, uh, creating a Lambda that is connected with the proper uh, permissions and policies already in place. And, and all of it is going to be automatically connected. Because the problem here, so when when we were seeing, I mean, when it, when Amazon uh, released the Amazon Lambda for the first time, it was at 2006, if I'm not wrong, more or less. So um, it was revolutionary. It was like S3, you know, at the beginning. So it was something that is revolutionary. And I started checking it. I really felt in love and I wanted to use it in all the projects that I had. But one of the problems is really this, no? I mean, how do you handle if... If we're saying that from going from monolith 
applications to microservices sometimes it's complicated because you have to manage a lot of microservices and it can be really a trouble imagine when your microservices is just a function no? so you really need a framework and here with chalice what you have is um, i mean here i'm uh, check out i mean my projects that, that are in github you want to really play with it and to have documentation about how to do all this process because actually um, I'm doing I'm a life uh, I'm a manning author so I'm creating a live project about really how to do this how to do a serverless um, architecture for processing video but all of it you can find it in my github so uh, so check it out um, but really at the end uh, if you check the chalice you see that everything is kind of uh, with annotations so with annotations and let me show you real code really fast because we don't have that much time for this talk and it's a pity I mean we could be talking for hours for all this so let me show you how a, a for example a serverless project looks like or for example how this example looks like no so this is actually this project so we have the app.py and, and in the simplest version you have uh, all your python code um, and you see that for example you have this kind of flask annotations that you define the roots the routing you have an, a, an authorizer um, and you define i mean if this authorizer applies to the routing for example and how we, so if you check this project uh, you don't have the feeling that you are working with a serverless application that it horizontally scales and it can handle thousands of requests per second actually if you need really more <laughs> um, I mean it can scale as much as you want I mean as much as Amazon can provide and it's a lot I mean it really if you want to go beyond their limits you can request for more concurrency but it's really I mean but it feels like when you're working on it it feels like a uh, just a normal monolith application where you have everything there no and for example if you want to capture the on uh, s3 event whenever a, a an element is created because you want to do the the task codification is as easy as using another uh, annotation so it's really you add another annotation in this case on s3 events we say to which bucket are we listening and to which event in this case it's just for creating and whenever yeah whenever i upload a video on f3 on that concrete bucket this function is going to be uh, executed no so all this code that i see together here no at the end is deployed in multiple different lambda functions no that are going to be performing different operations and that's the beauty of it so um if so i'm through here i can manage everything actually since my function lambdas, uh, I want them to have access to different, to DynamoDB, to SNS, to transcribe. So I can create a custom policy for development, and this policy is gonna be attached automatically to to my lambdas. No, so all these things that you see online, whenever someone talks about the beauty of working with uh, lambdas, no, and you see that people goes to to the console and they start creating uh, lambdas manually they go to the console and they write the code just there and then you have to go to the other service create a policy attach to it and and do all these tricky things all of it is just simplified for you uh, thanks to amazon chalice so thanks to this framework that is in python so what's the problem for most of the people? So why no, is not everyone using this? Uh, most of people are still using uh, JavaScript for Lambda functions. Um, and some people are still kind of migrating from monoliths to still microservices. So they are still on the Kubernetes Docker phase. And some projects, they really have to be there. I mean, it's difficult to do a refactoring and go from monolith to serverless in a goal, you no, know, in just one go. But um, but for most people, I mean, it's just working because here with Chalice, the trick part is that you have to work just with Python, no. But for us, I mean, it's a pleasure to work with Python. So 
Uh, I guess that everyone will agree here in this uh, in, in this conference. So for us, it's not a problem. It's even something good, you no? Know? But you see that, for example, this code that I just uploaded here. So this just three lines of code that I created with this just simple annotation. It just created this lambda function that we just um, one operation. I can deploy the whole project. Um, I can create, uh, as I said, it's going to create an Amazon Gateway automatically with all the REST API configured and, and connected to the, to the proper uh, lambdas. Uh, if I say that, for example, this lambda is going to listen for S3, it's going to get already connected. If I want to, for example, uh, so you see, I mean, all the projects. Um, so if I want to do the transcodification, I can do it. So using the BOTO3, that is the, this SDK for Python, for interacting with the SDK in, in Java. I in Java in Python, sorry. <laughs> so, so it's really simple to, to use it, no? And at the end of the day, um, yeah, just doing an, and for example, a Chalice uh, deploy. It's as easy as that, no? You do a Chalice deploy whenever you are done, and instead of testing this project in a simple, in a single file in your local file system, in your local laptop, uh, you deploy it automatically in multiple functions uh, on the cloud, and all of them are, it has its own concurrency. So unfortunately, I mean, we are really running out of time. Um, as I said, I mean, this is a big, big, big topic. Um, but I, I guess that uh, even if it's been a, a short, uh, fast talk, I remember the three things that I wanted to to get um, to get you. I mean, just the, um, that Amazon is is really cool to work with. Um, Chalice, check it out because for creating. Uh, serverless applications, like if you were working with a normal uh, monolith application, it's as simple as it sounds, as uh, creating a Django or Flask application, just knowing the the annotations that you need to use. And also about event-driven architecture, so how to change this mindset instead of creating a, a big project and coordinating everything from a single project, how to be more reactive and wait for an event to be created to populate the database or to check for the next step in the pipeline. So if there's any questions, just use the the, the channels that we have in Slack, uh, on LinkedIn, on mail or on Twitter, although I'm not that active. And I'm happy to talk about uh, technology and thanks, thanks for your time. And I hope that you learned something. I hope that you like it. Thanks everyone.